So, so let me just make sure I'm understanding this is a standalone Excel file that will work on most modern versions of Excel. Is there a particular version? Uh, um, every version of Excel is, of course, a tiny bit different, but I believe any um, modern version of Excel should run this. The one thing to note is um, that Google Sheets does not have all of the functionality of Excel. And many of my students try to run these things on Google Sheets and run into disasters. So I always tell them, okay, here's how you can get access to OpenOffice, LibreOffice, et cetera, so that you actually have all of the functionality of Excel. Oh, that's great. And that reminds me, maybe we can put those uh, versions up or, or put a note about that to help people. Can you just describe really 10,000 foot level what this um, set of tools is attempting to do? So this is a set of tools that is used to build uh, fairly simple models of the spread of infectious disease through a population. And in particular, I use this to guide students through the process of building a model starting from the very simplest, what's the simplest set of assumptions we can make and see what kind of pattern that predicts and then start thinking, okay, if we wanted to model a specific disease that has some extra features not included here, what would be those features that you might want to include? How can we include them in the model? And then Excel will do all the math for you and you can focus on sitting back and contemplating deep thoughts and saying, what does this all mean? That's great. And so I'm noticing that you have multiple tabs. Do you, yes. Is it organized to begin on the first tab and sort of get oriented then move through? That is the intent, yes. Great. So, so maybe just a, in this first model then, uh, it's labeled as basic model. I, let me start by scrolling over to the right here. So this is what is called an SIR model and is sort of the gold standard, uh, the very most basic, most common type of model used in epidemiology. And it assumes that you have a population who at any time can, each individual is in one of three categories. They are either susceptible, meaning they haven't yet caught the disease and could theoretically become infected at a later time, or they are in the infected category, uh, or they have recovered from the infection and cannot become infected again. Obviously, there are tons of assumptions we're making there. For instance, that immunity is permanent, that infection is transmitted directly from one person to another rather than needing a vector. Uh, what I do in class is I introduce this model and then I specifically ask students, what are some of the complications you'd like to add? But once we've gone through the basic model, it makes, a lot, it makes it a lot easier to add those features one at a time. Yeah, absolutely. So, so the, I'm assuming the graph then uh, susceptible is the blue line. Yes. Great, great. So that, that's one other thing. I mean, this is sort of a side note, but I talk with students about formatting graphs, not just in terms of professionality, but also in terms of clarity of communication. So one of the things I'll ask is, okay, we have to label our susceptible infected and recovered curves so they're different. Just intuitively, what color should I use for infected? And they'll all quickly say, oh, that should be red. How about recovered? That should be green. Okay, so let's use that intuition uh, where we can. That's great. That's great. Can, uh, so I noticed if you'd scroll up just a little bit, 
that we absolutely i'm going to zoom out a bit so we can also see the controls we'll go down to the phase plot momentarily okay. but here are the parameters for the population i'm having a population of 100 individuals i can change that as desired mm -hmm. i'm starting with three percent of the population infected so three infected individuals and I'm starting with no one who has recovered from the virus. So those would be people with natural immunity, people who have been vaccinated before the outbreak begins, et cetera. Great. Yeah, and having your students sort of talk through different ways that people could be recovered, that it could cover it, different categories. Yeah. Exactly. Then the epidemiological parameters, we have the transmission rate, uh, which is denoted as beta over in the equations here. And that's simply how easy it is to spread from an infected individual to a susceptible individual. So I will often ask students, what would be an example of a disease with a really high transmission rate? And typically that's something like measles, which is among the most transmissible diseases out there. COVID-19 isn't quite that high, but is close. And on the other side, you would have something like leprosy, which has a ridiculously low transmission rate. Okay, that's a good thing. Yes. <laughs> we'll take it. Okay, so then like, sorry. we have recovery rate. Mm -hmm. which is while you were infected, what is your probability at each time step of recovering from the disease? Mathematically, that's just the reciprocal of the duration of inf the infection. So a recovery rate here of 5% corresponds to an average duration of 20 days. Great, that's a nice uh, way to describe it to students. All, and all of these parameters can be controlled here with the sliders. And then in real time, you can see the effect on the course of the epidemic in terms of the rate, uh, sort of flattening the curve, if you will. Hey, look, that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But you can, that also, you, you can see the effect on the total number of individuals who ever become infected. For instance, right now, the number of susceptibles is going down to zero, meaning that over the course of the infection, everyone gets infected. Whereas if I dial this down a bit, uh, dial too far. <laughs> but here, say, we're leveling off where at least a few of the individuals never got infected. And um, if you ran it for longer time periods, would that continue? I believe so. Like we can look at the numbers here. Yeah, it's flattening out asymptotically at around 11.5, 11.4. But yes, this model can be extended. You just then have to update the graphs to make sure they include those later time points. Okay, but that is interesting that there is a... Uh... In this simple version, there's a reservoir of uninfected uh, people with a very low transmission rate. Right, right. Uh, now, in addition to this, so you can look at things like, you know, when are you going to get the peak of the infection and so on. Uh, one thing that's often useful to do is plot, draw what is called a phase plot, where instead of looking at the epidemic over time, what we're plotting here is the number of infected versus the number of susceptibles. And mathematically, you can solve for the conditions under which, say, the number of susceptibles was constant, so the change is zero, or the number of infected is constant, so the change there is zero. These are plotted as the null clines. So here in the blue dotted lines, which are just on the axes here, those are my S null clines, meaning that if I'm at any one of those points, my number of susceptibles is not changing. Right, right. Likewise, if I'm on one of my I null clines, 
then there, my number of infected is not changing. And what we see is over the course of an epidemic, you have a, a rapid drop in the number of susceptibles as the number of infecteds rise. Then once you cross this point, which is just a relationship between the transmission and recovery rates, I won't go into the details of that for now, but it, then it drops down and eventually will reach zero infected, meaning that the epidemic is over. So this is another nice visual way to uh, just sort of plot the overall epidemic. Well, and, and you know, phase plots can be challenging for students um, when you take out that time axis. So let me see if I've got it. If you were to make this more transmissible, transmissible, I would expect this phase plot to shift to the right. Uh, Oh, okay. See, I didn't quite get it right. So it, you're saying you want to shift this to the right so that the peak will go over here? Oh, well, I was just trying to, to puzzle through it. So, so just take oh, absolutely. one, one uh, manipulation. And, and, uh... So let's try, I think increasing the recovery rate is what we want. Okay. So let's see. Yes. Okay. So let me see. So I'm still at very high susceptible. I have uh, right low numbers of infected. And then it's a point of where's that isocline hit, where's the, the curve shift. Exactly. So as I speed up the recovery rate, my individuals are recovering so fast that they're not having enough time to spread the infection. And as a result, the epidemic ends before a large number of individuals have become infected. Okay, that's great. In practice, of course, it's generally hard to increase the recovery rate. What you can actually do is mess with the transmission rate. Right. And that has a similar effect if you're decreasing the transmission rate. So again, you're flattening the curve. Great. Now, students might be thinking of that in terms of um, when someone's uh, able to transmit the virus relative to when they're showing symptoms. Is that something that one of the later models takes a look at? Not currently, but that is a fairly easy uh, change to make. That's a modification called an SEIR model, where the E stands for an exposed or latent category. And I talked with Haley about the possibility of doing a COVID-specific model. That's one of the exact features that you'd introduce. Super. That's great. So Sound good for now? That does. Um, can you just do a, a real quick flash by a couple of the other models? Other models? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So here, number two is an intervention model, also potentially useful for COVID-19. So the idea here is it's the same model as before. Let me zoom in a bit so it's easier to see. But we now have a government that is in potentially at least monitoring the situation and responding to it. So once the percent currently infected exceeds some threshold, then the government of whatever municipality is being infected can do one of two responses they can either do a mass vaccination program and suddenly take some percentage of the susceptibles and move them directly into the recovered category, mm -hmm. or they can implement social distancing policies by, say, shutting down large gatherings, et cetera, and reducing the transmission rate. 
So let me show you the base model here. So here is a model in which um, there is no change. We detect something happening at once 20% of the population is infected, but we're doing nothing about it. Right, so now, it might be nice. It might be nice if we actually did something about it. Let's say we decide to vaccinate half of the susceptibles at that point. So now what you see here is this immediate drop off in the number of susceptibles at that time point, reflecting the mass vaccination. And as a result, what happens is we've got this weird discontinuity in the infected, but also the peak of the infected is lower and we are preventing at least some of the individuals from becoming infected. We're again flattening the curve. For something like COVID, where we don't have that option, even a reduction in the transmission rate can have that kind of effect. So here, uh, my understanding is that many of the social distancing uh, policies have reduced the transmission rate by about half. Mm -hmm. And so here we see what would happen if you implemented that kind of social distancing policy once 20% of the population is infected. Well, that's great because you can change the intervention threshold and then see exactly how the timing matters. Yep. I could, I could totally see students sort of taking a word problem and, and converting it into some parameters here to check. Yeah. So what I'd probably want to do is either bring in some literature or getting students to think, you know, okay, what, it, what here is most feasible to do, but also what are the corresponding costs? Well, I think too, and I'm sure you emphasize this in your teaching, you're, you're talking about a, uh, using a model to make predictions and then inform policy, right? The, the model is a simple exactly. But it shows you classes of behavior that you can then use in the decision making. Right. Okay, what's I'll next? Go on. I'll go on here to um, a model with group structure. So here we have two different groups who are creatively named high risk and low risk group. And these differ in a number of parameters. For instance, they, have, they can have different sizes. We can have the infection start with one or the other. And you can have differences in transmission rate within the groups, recovery rates within the groups. Right now, we don't have mortality involved in this model. I'm assuming everyone gets better eventually. Mm -hmm. But you could certainly include a mortality factor here where that's the main difference between the high and low risk groups. And you could see then, well, hey, what happens to the mortality in the high risk group depending on behavior in the low risk group? Again, something very, very relevant to COVID-19. So if I'm making sense of this, the high risk group is currently larger because it's a higher The high-risk group is smaller. It has 50 oh, individuals. Dark blue versus light blue. I got them backwards. And they're on different axes as well. So okay. oh, that's confusing. You. Yeah, the scaling. Great. And do you, how much guidance do you have to give students to sort of explore a scenario with these two groups? Is that... Typically, what I will do is we'll just be talking about, okay, how would you build such a model? And so we typically go back to our original model and say, aha, now what I need, instead of having one susceptible category and one infected and one recovered, is I have two of each and we can uh, transmit back and forth between them. But 
for simplicity, we'll say if you are a member of the low risk group, you stay in that low risk group. So you just have two parallel tracks, the low risk track and the high risk track, but they can interchange the infection between them. So, so they pretty quickly... I pretty quickly have them drawing schematic box and arrow diagrams showing flow of individuals. And from there, I'll ask them to write a couple of the equations. They can do so. And then rather than have them go through the grunt work of generating numbers, I say, okay, here's the model, go. Well, that's great. And it's, a, again, a nice concrete example about the assumptions that's built, that are built into the model that you're not yes. pitching groups. Right. So the final one I want to highlight, the final model, is a one that deals with stochasticity. So a lot of students, well, all of the models we've looked at assume that once you know the parameters, you know exactly what the model will do. And of course, that implies that models are perfect predictors and that biological systems behave in perfectly predictable ways, which generally ain't so. So here what I've done is converted the model into a stochastic version. So instead of saying, say, at each time point, 5% of infected individuals will recover, I say, at each time step, each infected individual has a 5% probability of recovering, which turns into formulas using the binomial distribution. Oh, that's great. Yeah. And what you can do then is rerun the model several times with the same parameter values and see that you get really different outcomes. And all of these are with exactly the same parameter values. In some cases though, I'm not getting it now of course, there, <laughs> the epidemic just never took off. It just didn't take off, right. And that I think can be really useful for not only showing students you know, error bars on your predictions, but also things like for COVID-19, there's a reason why all those graphs of number of cases start with 10 or 100 cases rather than the first case. Because it's small numbers, stochasticity dominates, and you have no pattern at all. Clear and I sort of- The population genetics too, right? Exactly. And I sort of sum that up here by showing here the solid curved lines are the deterministic model. Mm -hmm. And then for each, I've got four corresponding stochastic runs shown as the lighter curves. So here are the green curves for the four stochastic runs. And if you do this enough times, I'm claiming, though I haven't checked, that <clears throat> the curves, the deterministic model is just the average, the mathematical average of all those individual stochastic runs. But then I'll get to students talking about, you know, what we could do with this is sort of get 95% confidence intervals for what we expect the epidemic to do in the future. Yeah, but the, it's more than that, too, because the implications of the, the um, epidemic not taking off, right? That that exactly. So here it's taking off all the time. But here we have two cases where it didn't. So we have two green lines going here, but the other two got stuck down here. Right. It's confusing to pick them all out. Um, but I sort of wanted to have it that way so that your eye went to the deterministic pattern and then looking at each of these individual cases as well, that could have happened. Very nice. Very nice. And so, um, Tony, what kinds of classes are you using these materials with? 
Um, I use this mainly in my mathematical biology course, which includes mostly sophomores and juniors, uh, a mix of bio majors and math majors. But I think models like this could be done as early as a uh, high school scale. Because what we're, you know, we're not doing any math that's more complicated than addition, multiplication, subtraction. We're keeping track of a lot of things, but at no point are we bringing in calculus. You know, a, a real mathematician would look at this and say, well, you should write those as differential equations. And yes, we should. But this provides a pretty good approximation in most cases. Right. And you get some of those behavioral features that you really want to highlight in the model context. So I've, I've had students before who, working with models like this, have literally said, oh, my God, if I'd known that math could do stuff like this, I would have liked it more. <laughs> 